my distinct pleasure to introduce our chief guest uh, of this evening and uh, the one who's going to deliver the Lawrence Diana Pinkham Memorial Lecture on this occasion. Mr. Chandra Uday Singh uh, is, a, uh, is a unique presence here in some ways because he is, has been a journalist and he is now of course a uh, senior advocate in the Supreme Court uh, right up there in the top echelons. And he was not a journalist, he was not just a token journalist. I happened to be looking through internet the other day and uh, they then find that he's broken many stories. For instance, I think he was the one who discovered this person called Baba Amte in Maharashtra when he was just a quiet person doing kicking out, a, or shall we say, applauding a lonely furrow out there. He did a story on him and it, uh, he was then the, uh, I think the chief of bureau, he covered Maharashtra and Bombay for India today and uh, it was a multiple spread story in India today and that's how Baba Amte became known to the rest, of, he should have of course been introduced to the rest of India and the world. So that was one of the stories. There are many stories for me to recount here. There was another story he did uh, which uh, I heard him explain in another meeting uh, on YouTube. This was about a, a forger, a forger who was uh, an excellent forger. He used to forge paintings and uh, have them written about by illustrious people including the likes of Kapila Vatsai who went into analysis of his work and they discovered that he was a forger and he used to put used a peculiar pigment which was used in the earlier years. Uh, the, I won't go into the gory details of how he made the pigment. I mean, he, that's part of the story. So he's uh, made this transition from being a very successful journalist uh, and, uh, and, and, and he certainly had a great career ahead as a journalist but decided to become a lawyer and became a, an advocate and he's now of course uh, one of the top uh, advocates in the country, senior advocate in the Supreme Court of India. He was a late entrant to legal practice. After schooling in Mayo College in Ajmer and earning his Bachelor of Commerce in Bombay, he moved to his ancestral village in Punjab to rediscover his roots. For the next three years, he worked on the family crop farm near Kimkaran, followed by a year running a small dairy and milk supply business in Haryana and Delhi. Chandrudev Singh returned to Bombay in 1980 where he worked as a journalist, which I was talking about, first freelance and then as Bombay correspondent of the news magazine India Today. During his four year stint with the magazine, he, er he earned his bachelor's in law in the government law college in Bombay, now Mumbai. He was enrolled as an advocate in September 1984. And after four years of trial work in the labor and industrial courts, he practiced primarily in the Bombay High Court with occasional forays to the Supreme Court for two decades. Chandal was designated a senior advocate in 2005, a relatively very late entrant. And in 2009, he shifted to the Supreme Court of India where he appeared as counsel in a broad array of cases. Apart from his daily run of commercial courses, intellectual property disputes, arbitration and insolvency cases and regulatory matters for SEBI. He has also appeared in many public courses like the Aadhaar Challenge, the National Anthem case, LGBTQ rights, the Article 370 case, a challenge to the beef ban in Maharashtra, challenges to love jihad laws and bulldozer justice, the, penguin, the, the Pegasus case where Ram and I were uh, the petitioners, among others. The BBC documentary matter. He is also part of the legal defense team set up by the National Law Universities Project 39A for death penalty convicts. So he is indeed a unique uh, asset and uh, presence here this afternoon. Uh, this man who straddled journalism and now does equally a, a meteoric rise in, in, in the realm of law as a lawyer, as a senior advocate. And therefore, we are very happy when he asked him uh, whether he'd come. He was, he was so gracious and so, you know, he has, to, he has court hearings tomorrow and <laughs> he said he'll take a red-eye flight back to Delhi and, and attend to that. So that's how uh, um, 
willing he was, and I'm, we are very grateful for him making his time to be here this evening. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, with great pleasure, I have great pleasure in inviting uh, Chandra Uday Singh to deliver the Lawrence Dana Pinker Memorial Lecture for 2023. Thank you very much for that uh, uh, glowing and not entirely earned uh, tribute to me, uh, Shashi. Um, to, I, I must say that uh, it wasn't uh, grace on my part at all. I was overwhelmed by, the, uh, by being chosen uh, and being asked to deliver the Lawrence Dana Pinkham uh, Memorial Lecture. I, um, um, you know, uh, for me, a convocation, a graduation ceremony for students is uh, something which I, I, I really uh, think is, is one of the most important uh, things that can, that can, uh, that happen. And to be asked, and this is the first time in my life that I've ever been asked, so I was overwhelmed and I, it, I didn't take a moment to respond. I got the email and instantly, <laughs> you know, I just got back to Shachi and said, yes, of course, I, I, it's a privilege, it's an absolute honor. Um, uh, and and I, I, I genuinely believe that. So, um, I, I really am, uh, you know, um, absolutely, uh, even the footsteps that I follow, and I, I, was, I saw the list of, of uh, uh, persons who have uh, addressed this, these convocations before me, and, uh, and, and that itself uh, was very humbling for me uh, to, to be uh, offered and, and asked uh, to do this. So, so I thank uh, uh, Shashi Kumar, I thank the, the deans uh, of, of studies, uh, Dr. Nalini Rajan, uh, and Dr. Kushbu Narayan, I, I'm, I'm uh, you know, um, really, really, uh, it's, it's quite uh, amazing to be here with the, with the jury members, with all the winners of the awards, and of course, with all the students who are going to be getting their diplomas today uh, and, and passing out of this great institution. So without further ado, let me come to the Lawrence Dana Pinkham uh, Memorial Lecture. Um, which is reclaiming the freedom of speech and expression in an Orwellian dy uh, dystopia. I guessed that, uh, 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 and I, I then cross-checked with Sashi that the median age, I guess, of this graduating class would be around 23. That would make the emergency a little more than a historical concept for you, a period that you heard or read about, but perhaps of no greater immediacy than hearing about the British Raj or the freedom struggle, the independence or partition. Born a quarter century after what we saw as the great aberration of 1975 to 1977 and coming of age in an era of boisterously noisy journalist, journalism, you will be hard put to understand what it meant for a free nation to be plunged into overnight censorship and a universal news blackout just 25 years after we became a republic. Try to imagine the shock of a nation that woke up on 25th June 1975 to blank front pages of newspapers, followed by 21 months of force-fed government propaganda. Television news didn't exist in those days. The foreign media was banished from India. Newspapers and the few magazines that existed had to submit their galleys to government censors and one of the few sources of real news that remained was BBC's Asia service, which was, I think, uh, it was primarily in Urdu, but uh, that was about the only source of information um, that, that remained for, for Indians to reach out to. A quarter century after we the people gave ourselves our constitution in 1950, the promise of free speech and expression guaranteed by Article 191A had sputtered out not least because of the Supreme Court's capitulation in the infamous judgment in ADM Jabalpur versus Shivkan Shukla. By a miracle, that's a whole another story, we survived. Elections came to be called, the emergency was lifted and from 21st March 1977, our media bounced back to almost four decades of unbridled optimism. The boisterous noise I spoke of turned into a din 
amplified by prime time shouting matches on television, on the ground investigations, and reports that claimed with unfailing regularity to have exposed yet another scam. A plethora of magazines supplemented the newspaper world and regional language publications gained unprecedented circulations and reach. The memory of the emergency faded out and it became unimaginable that with the ubiquitous internet and social media that developed in the next two decades and courts that swore never to let ADM Jabalpur rise again, journalists or the purveyors of news would ever again be muzzled. But the optimists have now been betrayed by a strong government, a government which believes that a brute majority in parliament is justification enough to tame and bend the media to do its bidding. Borrowing from the modern autocrats playbook and aware that outright censorship would not work in the 21st century, the NDA BJP government which came to power in 2014 soon adopted the time-tested recipe for boiling a frog. You put it in a saucepan filled with cold water and gently raise the temperature so gradually that it is lulled into warmth and comfort and ultimately falls into a topper that it cannot shake off when the water finally comes to a boil. That's really where we've been going in the last nine years, gradually coming to the boil. This phase was launched by delegitimizing the media. It began with union ministers using words like prostitutes to describe journalists. It progressed with press conferences being shunned and correspondence being barred from accompanying the Prime Minister on official foreign visits. It moved on to the use of single source handouts of prepared scripts, photographs and film clips. And it sent out a message by limiting access to the Prime Minister to a handful of carefully selected interviewers. Taking a leap from strongman leaders in other times and other nations, the Prime Minister set up a direct channel of communication with the public through his radio program, Man Ki Baat, which was duly amplified by government media and the government's cheerleaders in the private mass media. Simultaneously, a carrot and stick approach was adopted with generous government advertising to favored outlets on one hand, while advertisement, uh, advertising cutbacks and the threat of choking their other businesses faced network owners and newspaper proprietors who failed to play ball. In a nation where almost every national television network and most newspaper chains are owned by industrialists who need government patronage or at least need the cooperation of government, the underlying threat, whether covert or overt, could not fail to bring home the bacon. A favoured method of taming the media is to make an example by easing out many of those who stand for journalistic independence. Reliance Industries had made several investments in media companies, often as an angel investor to save the pro professionally run independent media house from bankruptcy. Until 2014, the public stance of Reliance was that it was not going to take over majority control nor interfere with the running of such entities. This subtly changed in 2014. That might be a complete coincidence, the, the year. But the change in 2014 when Reliance took control of Network 18 through a hostile takeover, prompting Rajdeep Sardesai, the editor-in-chief, and Sagrika Ghosh, the deputy editor, to resign, with Sardesai publicly vo voicing his concerns about losing editorial independence. Dropping the hands-off approach after the net Network 18 takeover, it is reported that Reliance now controls more than 70 television outlets around the country, with a combined weekly audience of at least 80 crore viewers. The period since 2017 witnessed more overt pressure, some of which came on the heels of meetings with, between the Prime Minister and media proprietors. Barkha Dutt was made to resign from NDTV in January 2017. Bobby Ghosh, the editor-in-chief of Hindustan Times, who had introduced the hate tracker, was forced to resign in September 2017. And of course, the hate tracker then vanished from Hindustan Times. Harish Khare was eased out from editorship of the Tribune after an investigation under his watch exposed the massive data breaches enabled by Aadhaar's architecture. Those were the days when they were still 
jealously trying to say that Aadhaar, uh, Aadhaar's architecture is foolproof. Now they have given up that pretense. ABP's managing director Milin Khandekar and ABP TV's anchor of Masters Rope Punya Prasun Bajpai both abruptly resigned in August 2018, followed by Abhisar Sharma of ABP News in September of that same year. Faye D'Souza was forced out of Mirror Now in September 2019, and Shamira Singh had to leave Aaj Tak for tweets critical of the Prime Minister in July 2021. And these are only the widely reported instances, as many more fly beneath the radar. Self-censorship caused by concentration of ownership, coupled with the use of collateral power mechanisms to silence erudite critics, has showed up in other forms too. A widely discussed example is Ramchandra Guha's withdrawal of his fortnightly column in the Hindustan Times, triggered by the newspaper's apparent refusal to publish his column on the government's Central Vista project. Another equally eminent public intellectual, Pratap Hanu Mehta, was sought to be pressurized to stop criticizing the government in print by putting pressure on the board of Ashoka University, of which he was the dean. But rather than be silenced, Mehta left the university and moved to another in America. And to the credit of it, the Indian Express, they continued his weekly op-ed column without a break. Fortunately, we still have it every week. The use of media proprietors to secure a tame environment came full circle with the hostile takeover of NDTV, the last of the old guard which was attempting to deliver independent news. A survey by the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism had indicated that 81% of all other parties' political supporters and even 75% of BJP supporters found NDTV to be a trusted source of news and information. The continuing independence of this channel, despite income tax raids and other government actions, was obviously unpalatable to the powers that be. As it happened, the Adani group, headed by Gautam Adani, whose symbiotic relationship with the Modi government is common knowledge, had quietly bought over a private investment company formerly owned by Reliance, through which Reliance had financed NDTV's proprietors many years ago to stave off the creditors. Though the purpose of that financing was long over and the debts repaid, the investment company retained the right to purchase 20% more shares in Pranoy and Radhika Roy's personal investment vehicle, through which they owned majority shares in NDTV. Gautam Mandari suddenly exercised that right and in addition made a public offer to purchase 20% additional shares as per SEBI's takeover quote, which inevitably led to the ex exit of Pranoy and Radhika Roy. This was widely perceived as the end game for independent media in India, prompting a spate of resignations from NDTV's management, editorial staff and reporters, including that of NDTV India head Ravish Kumar. These recent takeovers by proprietors cozy with the ruling dispensation add to a media landscape which was already replete with government-friendly owners. To name a few, Republic TV was co-founded and mostly funded by Rajiv Chandrasekhar, who ostensibly relinquished his stake in 2019 in order to become a union minister. Z Media Corporation, part of the SL Group, is led by Subhash Chandra, a former member of the Raja Sabha, whose candidature was backed by the BJP. Odisha TV is owned by the family of Bhaja and Panda, the national vice president and spokesperson of the BJP, and News Life, a TV channel popular in the Northeast, is owned by Rinki Vuyar Sharma, wife of the BJP Chief Minister Vasam Himanta Bishwa Sharma. Not content with only leaning on planned television and newspaper proprietors, the current regime has also ratcheted up the pressure on independent media houses, journalists, and political comment and commentators by a malevolent mix of social media attacks, cancellation of licenses, launch of investigations by central agencies as also state police departments, and filing of multiple FIRs, often followed by arrests. This address cannot do full justice to the cases of journalists and media houses that have faced the brunt of state power, coupled with brutal mobs exercising the heckler's veto. I will allude to only some of them, but make no mistake, they are symptomatic of a broad-ranging and widespread assault on the freedom of speech and expression. A natural disaster that inadvertently provided the government a template for suppression of independent reporting was the COVID-19 pandemic. Faced with occasional criticism of their handling of the lockdowns, and especially the horrific migrant labor crisis, 
The central government as well as most BJP run states unleashed a disproportionate shoot the messenger backlash using the full might of their police powers as enhanced and immunized by special powers assumed under the Disaster Management Act, journalists were subject to arbitrary arrests and detention without charge merely for asking the questions that needed to be asked. The India Press Freedom Report 2020 by the Rights and Risks Analysis Group documented the targeting of, the, of at least 228 journalists and media houses through FIRs, show call notices requiring appearances during lockdowns, detention and questioning by the police without registration of any formal case. This was just during the period of those lockdowns. The authorities wielded an array of draconian laws including the Indian Penal Code, the Disaster Management Act, the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, the infamous UAPA, the Scheduled Caste and Scheduled Rights Prevention of Atrocities Act, the POXO Act, which is meant for ju uh, uh, assault on ju juveniles, sexual assault on juveniles, etc. The India Press Freedom Report 2020 revealed that such coercion and browbeating were deployed to prevent journalists from exposing corruption by officials, by politicians, and even by hospitals, from reporting communal violence perpetrated under the guise of COVID prevention, from commenting against the CAA NRC from reporting on denial of food rations to migrant workers and reporting on the mismanagement and negligence at quarantine centers. We, our memories actually sometimes fade, but you will recall that we had these horrific conditions in quarantine centers which were made into virtual prisons. People were, were locked in there, not allowed to leave and so on. And when that was reported, the reporters, would, the journalists would be picked up. All that was needed to unleash police action was an allegation that the concerned report was fake news, quote unquote. The pandemic also became the backdrop for unleashing the income tax authorities on organizations deemed critical of the regime. Dainik Bhaskar, one of the largest circulators in Hindi, Hindi newspapers, faced the full might of the income tax department after their reporters carried out meticulous documentation and reporting on thousands of corpses floating down the Ganga and thousands more buried in shallow sand banks in Uttar Pradesh and Bihar as their families lacked the means to cremate them during the second wave of COVID-19. These revelations destroyed the government's carefully cra crafted narrative of victory over the pandemic, which had been dutifully touted by the mainstream media. Nemesis followed in the form of the tax inspector, and Derek Bhaskar was at least temporarily silenced. In similar manner, certain organizations promoting independent media initiatives have been targeted using the Foreign Contribution Regulation Act, the Taxman, and other central agencies. This template has been used time and again since then, most recently against the BBC for their not-to-be-mentioned documentaries on Gujarat. More worrisome still is the revelation in the India Press Freedom Report that 13 journalists have been killed during the period covered by the report either with the police's involvement or with the police's failure to provide protection when there were serious apprehensions to their lives. The report highlights the fact that most physical attacks and assaults on journalists or their families were orchestrated by mobs of unidentified persons, apparently the result of systematic planting of hostility against independent media and journalists critical of the government. The shocking assassination of Gauri Lankesh on 5th September 2017 was not isolated. By 2021, Reporters Sans Frontières or Reporters Without Borders ranked India among the five most dangerous countries for journalists. Mark that. The five most dangerous countries in the world for journalists, India was one of them. While the number of fatalities was pegged at four in RSF's 2021 report, the UNESCO Observatory of Killed Journalists recorded that six journalists had been killed in India in 2020. The report by RSF specifically stressed that journalists in India were subjected to all kinds of attack, attacks, including, quote, police violence, amb ambushes by political activists, and reprisals instigated by criminal groups or corrupt local officials, unquote. The report decried the radical right-wing Hindu spokesman for overt attempts to paint journalists who are not aligned with their ideology as anti-nationals and for their calls to purge all manifestations of anti-national thought from the public debate. 
The report notes that what starts as an outcry against supposed anti-national by a minister or occupant of public office soon snowballs into coordinated social media campaigns of hate and dehumanization, in some cases leading to terrifying calls for execution of journalists. Then this is probably where the, uh, the report by the two young journalists on, on, on how um, um, social media can be amplified, can amplify hate. That, pro that is probably the kind of ecosystem that is used to, to, um, to create this sort of uh, atmosphere. Similarly, a report by the International Press Institute, a global network of editors, media executives and leading journalists who defend and promote media freedom across the globe, identified 83 violations of press freedom in India in a short six-month period from April to September 2022. Noting a spike in mob attacks against journalists, IPI's report recorded that four journalists were assaulted by a mob at a Hindu Mahapanchayat event in Delhi, while five other journalists were tortured by members of a local mafia when they tried to expose illegal operations of liquor dons. In May 2022, journalist Subhash Kumar Mahato was shot dead while walking near his home in the village of Sakho in Bihar. As many as 20 journalists were arrested during this period, including Kashmiri journalist Fahad Shah and fact-checking journalist Mohammed Zubair of uh, Alt News. Fahad Shah, the editor-in-chief of online magazine Kashmirwala, was first arrested in February 22, following a report pertaining to an encounter in Pulwama. When he was granted bail after 22 days of custody by a special court under the National Investigation Agency Act, he was immediately arrested by the Shopian police. On 7th March 22, with an hour of securing bail from a magistrate court in Shopian, Shah was again arrested for the third time in a month by the Srinagar police for social media posts allegedly, quote, tantamount to glorifying the terrorist activities and causing dent to the image of law enforcing agencies besides causing ill will and disaffection against the country, unquote. This is the charge on which he is arrested. He completed a year in prison in February this year. His incarceration now converted to preventive detention under the stringent Public Safety Act. So each time he gets bail under one law, Another one is invoked, and finally, when all the laws are exhausted, they, they uh, fall back on the Public Safety Act, which is a preventive detention law only in the state, in the Union Territory now of Kashmir. Journalists from around the world urge his, his release in a joint statement, recognizing that quote Shah's case is a sharp reminder of the need to strengthen free voices as efforts to shut them down intensify daily around the globe. His release is particularly important to the cause of free press in Kashmir." Unquote. Other instances of the systematic effect, effort to silence inconvenient voices abound, often using spurious charges under the debunked and now temporarily halt, halted offense of sedition, and of course the full force of counter-terrorism and national security laws. When Mir Faisal, a journalist with the online news magazine Article 14, tweeted about the assault on five journalists during a demonstration in Delhi by right-wing Hindu groups, the Delhi police initiated an investigation against him on grounds of inciting hatred between communities. Rana Ayu, a Washington Post columnist who was an outspoken critic, critic of the BJP, was prevented from flying up out of the country to attend a journalism event in March 22, allegedly because of an investigation into money laundering and tax evasion, which had been denied by Ayu. In a period of six months, a used bank accounts and other assets were frozen twice based on the same unestablished allegations. Special rapporteurs of the US, United Nations Human Rights Council, Irene Khan and Mary Lawler, came to her defense following what they termed as, quote, relentless, misogynistic and sectarian attacks against her in response to her efforts to shine a light on public interest issues and to hold power to account through her reporting, unquote. Muslim women journalists have also been the target of several nefarious base attacks launched with the objective of humiliating and degrading them in the form of fake auction apps and rape threats. These social media attacks and backlashes have often been linked to accounts identifying themselves as BJP supporters with little done to shut them down. A particularly egregious episode was the marathon raid conducted in 2021 at the house of Prabir Purkhayasta editor-in-chief of the news website News Click. The septuagenarian and his partner were detained at home for the entire duration of the raid, 
which reportedly went on for nearly 114 hours without being informed of the charges for which they were under investigation. Burkha Yasta, like other former and current members of Digipub, an association set up in 2020 to represent independent digital news media, has been the subject of incessant trolling at the hands of right-wing netizens who created an ecosystem of hate by multiple attacks that spread like wildfire on social media using coordinated and synchronized pro-government YouTube channels and Twitter handles. These right-wing hardliners get increasingly emboldened by the impunity and lack of consequences they face even when they resort to abhorrent tactics such as explicit calls for execution of certain journalists. While such elements are allowed to go scot-free, policing of the media has scaled new heights with the sphere for free and independent journalists continually shrinking. For instance, in 2018, the district authorities in Uttar Pradesh's Lalitpur demanded that journalists register their WhatsApp groups with the information department and administrators were ordered to furnish details of all members of each group along with Aadhaar card details and photographs. It was threatened that non-compliance with the order would invoke legal action under the Information Technology Act, even though there is neither any such requirement under that act, nor provision for punishment for its breach. A similar dictate of making WhatsApp registration mandatory had been issued by the Kashmir state government in 2016. The fraught conditions presently faced by Indian journalists are exemplified by the case of Siddiqui Kappal. As recently as in February this year, Siddiqui was finally released on bail after over two years behind bars without being formally charged under the UAPA. Kappan and three others had been detained while on their way to Hathras in Uttar Pradesh where a Dalit woman had died after allegedly being raped, uh, being ga gang raped. Not to be outdone, the enforcement directorate had also filed a money laundering case against Kappan, accusing him of having links with the now banned Popular Front of India and receiving money from them. In September 22, the Supreme Court granted Kappan bail under UAPA as no formal charges were filed against him. But his incarceration continued on account of the money laundering charges. He was finally granted bail in the money laundering case in December 22 by the Allahabad High Court, which noted that transactions of a paltry sum of 5,000 rupees had been alleged against him and his co accused So this entire money laundering charge was based on 5,000 rupees. Even after that, various procedural hurdles set up by the state ensured that Kappan spent another two months in custody. To no one's surprise, the parlous state of our news media is reflected in the view of India from abroad. Tellingly, the meticulously researched World Press Freedom Index, published every year by Reporters Without Borders, has seen our country slide from a rank of 140 in 2014 to 150 out of a total of 180 nation studies in 22. My, I, uh, I wrote this speech uh, only a week ago and uh, it has been overtaken now by the new report which has moved us down further from 150 to 161 and we are now below Afghanistan and Pakistan and Belarus and of course all other countries in South Asia except Bangladesh which is 163. Uh, so we can be proud that we are uh, two, two stages better than Bangladesh. The 2022 report on India opens with, quote, the violence against journalists, the politically partisan media, and the concentration of media ownership all demonstrate that press freedom is in crisis in the world's largest democracy. Ruled since 2014 by Prime Minister Narendra Modi, the leader of the Bharatiya Janata Party, and the embodiment of the Hindu nationalist right, unquote. It further pinpoints the most significant issue plaguing Indian media today in terms of, quote, a spectacular rapprochement between Narendra Modi's party, the BJP, and the big family dominating the media, unquote. This is, this is what uh, uh, um, uh, Reporters Without Borders has actually, is actually said as the, the reasons why Indian media is in a crisis. Today, the situation has gone beyond mere corporatization of Indian journalism with monopolization of mainstream media by big friendly corporations. The concentrated media ownership through politically affiliated or favorable entries and the blurring of lines between media, business and politics have clearly diluted the opportunities for genuine unbiased reporting and the sanctity of the space that is required to bring about plural, plural, plurality, diversity of opinion and dissent. Indeed, 
far from batting from the wonder, wonderful secular ethos of our nation, some of the most influential mass media have turned themselves into cheerleaders for communalism and hate speech. No one will have forgotten the manner in which Muslims were vilified as spreaders of the COVID-19 virus and the use of scrolling banners like Corona Jihad, Love Jihad and Land Jihad and other malicious untruths on the major television channels. Nor should anybody forget the sight of television anchors from leading national channels riding triumphantly with the drivers of bulldozers that were used to destroy Muslim homes, shops and small businesses in the aftermath of communal riots stoked by equally triumphal Ram Navami and Hanuman Jayanti processions just last year in April 2022. And of course, certain channels like Sudarshan TV and anchors like Sudhi Chaudhary of Ajdak have made a specialty of peddling hate and spewing venom that borders on calls for genocide. In an Orwellian inversion of truth and values, the purveyors of true hate and falsehood can claim protection under our constitutional guarantee of the freedom of speech and expression. And indeed they do. When a bench of the Supreme Court entertained challenges against hate speech and pulled up these anchors, they were made, met with indignant claims of press freedom. Yet, those who expose communalism and hatred, or those who call the state to account for its failures in, protecting, in providing protection to minorities, or to, or to conscientious dissenters, or social activists, or protectors of forests and tribal rights, are dubbed anti-national and sought to be prosecuted. Just a few days ago, it was reported that the CBI registered a case against the environment lawyer Ritwik Dhatta, founder and head of legal initiative for forest and environment life. His crime is that he was fighting for preservation of forests and was thereby attempting to stall coal projects in protected forests through litigation. Not content with the subjugation of big media through crony buyouts, acquisition and direct pressure on pr proprietors, the government has simultaneously sought to control the smaller players who perforce function in the online universe. Using the ever-available excuse of national security, the government has sought to systematically tighten the screws on digital media, internet news services, YouTube services, podcast producers and the like. The information technology rules of 2021 extended the government powers under Section 69A of the Information Technology Act 2000 to block internet content and effectively censor publishers in the interest of sovereignty, integrity, defense of India and security of the state or preventing a cognizable offense. These powers were used selectively by the government to block over 100 YouTube channels in 2022 besides blocking selected accounts on social media platforms. Further amend amendments in 2022 led to a tightening of the IT rules to strengthen the grip of, of government over social media. It allowed a government panel to overrule social media suspensions on the basis of the internal guidelines, effectively giving government control over content moderating decisions that social media companies make. This could result in platforms being required to reinstate accounts or posts taken down for being in violation of site-wide rules within the Indian Territory. The government, in effect, empowers itself to decide what kind of speech should be aired on social media platforms, overruling the general rules of the digital intermediary and its decisions without any transparency or accountability. So it works both ways. What should be brought back on and what should be taken off, all will be decided by the government. It further allowed for users to escalate complaints of social media posts that they wanted suppressed to the government panel, thus using the might of majority, muscle and toxicity to target and potentially silence outspoken voices, even if they complied with the internal guidelines of the social media platforms. These amended rules were put to use when a BBC documentary in Gujarat leaked out before its release date and started to get aired on social media. Part one of the BBC documentary, based on footage of the 2002 Gujarat program, and the manner in which then Chief Minister Narendra Modi had dealt with the carnage was directed to be removed from Twitter and YouTube in purported exercise of emergency powers conferred by the Information Technology Intermediary Guidelines and Digital Media Ethics Code 2021. Ex parte takedown orders were issued against persons who were neither given notice nor furnished with the reasons for such takedown orders. The Ministry of External Affairs labelled the documentary as a propaganda piece designed to push a particular discredited narrative. 
The censorship was sought to be justified by an advisor to the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting on the ground that the documentary was intended to undermine the sovereignty and integrity of India with the potential to adversely impact India's friendly relations with foreign countries and also public order within the country. So the ministry didn't put out any statement but an advisor put out an official, a so-called official statement. The blocking order and related proceedings were completely opaque with the government failing to place this order in the public domain. Unsurprisingly, this was followed by tax raids on BBC's Delhi and Mumbai offices. This has been the present government's go-to response to any critique or assessment of the pressures on India's democratic structures by international bodies as also foreign media. Instead of engaging meaningly, meaningfully by dealing with the criticism in a spirit of trust and accountability, the government merely rubbishes and seeks to discredit the messenger. The import could not be more apparent. Anyone who questions the government and strays from blind conformity is attacked as a traitor, anti-national or desh drohi, or is alleged to be part of an international conspiracy against India. Equating unquestioning acceptance of the ruling party's narrative with patriotism has converted the mainstream media into mouthpieces of the government. To add to the difficulties that face journalists in many parts of the country, de facto censorship is repeatedly caused by limiting access to public digital resources. According to the Software Freedom Law Center, there have been over 650 internet shutdowns in India since 2012 the vast bulk of them after 2014. Data compiled by Global Digital Rights Group Access Now and the Keep It On Coalition show that India implemented at least 82 internet shutdowns in 2022 alone, becoming the worst offender of all the nations that call themselves democracies. These shutdowns have been used to throttle communications by peaceful democratic movements and have also provided cover for violence by wiping out communication channels as they bring about a total ban on mobile or fixed line internet. The justification for such widespread shutdowns on the ground that misinformation and rumors can result in deterioration of law and order is not convincing, especially since the absence of reliable information sources like news outlets results in far greater spread of false information. Such justifications might have carried greater conviction if the shutdowns were not used for the most part against protest movements aimed at government actions, like the prolonged and completely peaceful farmers' agitation in Punjab, Haryana and the borders of Delhi. The crowning glory of this assault on internet news and digital information is the attempt to completely invert the role of government and the media. Taking a leap from Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, the government has now amended the IT rules of 2021 yet again, this time to decree that the truth about the central government will be what the central government says it is, and that everything else will be taken down as misleading. The 2023 amendment to the IT rules 21 notified just this April, authorized a fact, -check, a fact check unit of the central government to identify fake or false or misleading information in respect of, quote, any business of the central government, thereby making the union government the sole arbiter of what news about it can or cannot be published. This is a travesty without parallel and becomes more so when one considers that the government's fact check unit will be the Press Information Bureau which is for all intents and purposes the government's propaganda machine. These rules are a definite case of executive overreach, not least because they are without any guidelines or checks or balances and constitute press censorship which is abhorrent to any democracy apart from being patently in breach of Article 191A of the Constitution. While the ambit of these rules have been expanded to include social media intermediaries, internet service providers or other, other service providers, Failure to take down any content identified as fake or false or misleading by the government's fact check unit would result in such platforms losing their safe harbor protections, thus rendering the intermediary liable for any third party information, data or communication links made available on or hosted by the intermediary. This is a source of great, greater concern given the Press Information Bureau's past history of fact checking, which has arbitrarily flagged news critical of the government as fake and subsequently backtracked on its claims. Further, the strict procedures delineated for blocking or taking down content in the Supreme Court judgment in Shreya Singhal have been completely bypassed. Curious, curiously, and this is the strangest thing, 
the draft amendment which was published in January 2023 calling for public comments contained only provisions to regulate online gaming companies. Hours before the public consultation deadline end expired, a new draft was published which gave the government these powers of censorship under the guise of fact check. Fact checking. So it is, this is buried inside a, an amendment which deals only with gaming. And there's buried this one little thing. And this was, this was just hours before the deadline for public uh, consultation got over. This invited strong objections from the Editors Guild, Digipub, and the Internet Freedom Foundation, but the amendments were pushed through regardless. If much of this sounds bleak and forbidding, we need to remind ourselves that difficult times are also times of opportunity. And this I really address to this graduating class. Difficult times are also times of great opportunity. And the more that the state tries to suppress the truth, the greater the possibility of unearthing a scoop. Television channels have been bought up and subjugated. But television journalists like Karan Thapar, Barkha Dhat, Faye D'Souza, Ravish Kumar, Arfa Khanam Sherwani, Avisa Sharma, and a slew of others have taken to YouTube and Telegram with a measure of success. They reach a smaller audience than television, but they make their voices heard nonetheless. Online newspapers like The Wire, Scroll, Quint, and many others in every language in the country have mastered the art of multiplying their message through online print, audio podcasts, YouTube, and online streaming services. And of course, some venerable holdouts in the traditional broadsheet newspapers continue to speak truth to power a leading example of which is your, your city's very own The Hindu. Pick up Maria Ressa's How to Stand Up to a Dictator and you will see how this diminutive American returned to her roots in the Philippines to fight for the preservation of democracy, first as a reporter for CNN and then as co-founder and editor of Rappler.com, taking on President Rodrigo Duterte's autocracy against all odds and in the face of threats to her freedom and her life, Ressa was ultimately awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2021, together with another indomitable journalist, Dmitry Muratov, editor of the Russian newspaper Novaya Gazeta. To use an old cliche, Maria Ressa proved to every journalist in the world threatened by the spread of autocracy that when the going gets tough, the tough get going. And those who decide to, good, to fight the good fight must know that when one walks the path of the righteous, one is never alone. Even the courts, which sometimes appear to be succumbing to the pressures of an overbearing executive, push back when things start to get really bad. Dealing with the indefinite suspension of internet services in Jammu and Kashmir, the Supreme Court of India in Anuradha Basin versus the Union of India ruled that such indefinite suspensions were illegal under the Indian constitution, holding that the role of the internet as a means of communication and information is fundamental and being a medium of expression, it enjoys protection under Article 191A. The court also held that any order to shut down or suspend the internet must mean, meet the twin tests of necessity and proportionality. Though the Supreme Court stopped short of granting meaningful relief to the doughty editor who filed that petition, the law laid down in Anuradha Basin sets a high benchmark for the government to meet in any future shutdown of the internet. I must qualify this by saying that we, we haven't really tested each shutdown. Uh, even even uh, uh, you know, the, the, lit, uh, the uh, public interest groups and the lawyers uh, in the Supreme Court, I think, have, have failed to push the Anuradha Basin, uh, uh, um, um, you know, the dicta or the dictum laid down there, we need to push it. Because the law is very clear now. That it is being abused is another matter, but there is, there is a clarity there. In the case of the IT rules 2021, legal challenges were mounted by digital media platforms and intermediaries in various high courts. In March 21, the Kerala High Court granted protection against coercive action under the rules to live law, a digital legal newspaper. Soon after that, the Bombay High Court, in the case of independent human rights and legal newspaper called the Leaflet, stayed the operation of Rule 9 of the 2021 rules, thus rendering the rules virtually toothless. The Madras High Court also recognized that the Bombay High Court stay order with respect to Rule 9 would be operative across the country. Those cases have all been transferred to the Supreme Court, along with a slew of other challenges to the set rules, but despite repeated efforts by the government to get the stay orders vacated, the Supreme Court declined to oblige. Meanwhile, the Bombay High Court has recently entertained a challenge 
to the 2023 IT rule amendment mounted by the comedian Kunal Kamra. So the, this latest one about the fact-checking unit has also become the subject matter of proceeding and the Bombay High Court has not yet grappled with it but they have rejected the government's contention that this is something beyond uh, the purview of the court and the court can't interfere with it, they have entertained the matter. Other seminal channel challenges that are pending before the Supreme Court include the alleged use of Pegasus spyware against journalists and others as also a challenge to the takedown orders in respect of the BBC documentary. In the Pegasus probe, the Supreme Court appointed committee, while coming to inconclusive findings, noted in its report that the central government has not cooperated with it. While issuing notice in the challenge to the censorship of the BBC documentary, the Supreme Court again resisted the petitioner's request to, uh, to, to direct the Union of India to make the blocking orders of the documentary public. Instead, the court has decided to wait for the Union government to file its reply before considering the matter further. But they have entertained it again, so, th so it's, they are in season of it. Though these judicial delays are disappointing, there can be no doubt that the Supreme Court as well as High Courts remain a strong bulwark against an executive that is determined to cut the media down to size. If one had any doubts about the judiciary's will and intent, they should be dispelled by a recent judgment. Just last month, the Supreme Court of India, in its judgment striking down the central government's ban on the Media One TV channel in Kerala, emphasized the need for freedom of the press in ringing terms. Quote, an independent press is vital for the robust functioning of a democratic republic. Its role in a democratic society is crucial, for it shines a light on the functioning of the state. The press has a duty to speak truth to power and pre present citizens with hard facts enabling them to make choices that propel democracy in the right direction. The restriction on the freedom of press compels citizens to think along the same tangent, a homogenized view on issues that range from socio-economic policy to ideologies would pose grave dangers to democracy." Unquote. The Supreme Court has, has again uh, spoken its mind in very, very clear terms in the Media One case. Perhaps the best way of looking at where we are, where we were and where we are is to remind ourselves just to flash back to the emergency of 1975-77. That was a time when journalists, I was still in college in those days, but journalists must have, many, many journalists must have thought, must have given up all hope. They must have thought that this is the end. It's not, uh, uh, it's not going to come back. But it did. It came back and it came back with a bang. The nation came back. We have to carry that hope with us because we have not gone. As I said, today, the, that level of, of muddling that was possible with an outright declared emergency is probably not possible at all today. And the, the a number of uh, of mechanisms and, and, and means of reaching out to people have uh, uh, expanded exponentially and the, 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 the means of completely muzzling uh, press, uh, uh, the, the government's means are also limited though they are misusing various agencies and so on but if, if, that, if the uh, courts were to push back on that, uh, a lot of the power of the government would be diminished. But I, am, I, I, I would like to end with this verse from Kipling, dating back, uh, uh, I don't know how many, uh, what, what it would be about, at least 100 years, 150 years or something. Quote, the Pope may launch his interdict, the union its decree, but the bubble is blown and the bubble is pricked by us and such as we. Remember the battle and stand aside while thrones and powers confess that king over all the children of pride is the press, the press, the press. I wish you all the very best in the graduating class of 2023.